sometimes loneliness is the worst thing that we contend with. The first emotion that God actually talks about is, is loneliness. There is a lostness in that emotion and that feeling. There is a, um, a segregation all its own in that thing that isolates you, puts you in a corner, and actually dismantles and disarms any rights you feel like that you have to sell money. In my life, I never ever thought that I would be in my um, later 50s, single, and in this place where everything that I thought that God was going to do, He didn't. Hey everybody, this is Rita Springer, and welcome to another episode of Worship is My Weapon. Thank you so much for just popping in here when you do and downloading or however you guys um, view your podcasting nowadays, whatever device you use. I, I really want what I try to offer here to be an encouragement. That's why I do this. It's why I keep doing this because I really feel like, man, the world could use a lot of encouragement. All of us could use a lot more encouragement. And um, I just thought, you know, I know I did an audible version of singleness and talked a little bit about singleness, but I just thought, uh, now that we're on YouTube, I really want to do a video version of this and, and just keep the subject open about singleness and, um, and the beauty of it, uh, the sacred qualities of it, but almost like the myth and the misconceptions of it. And some of the things that just frustrate the crud out of me about it. And, um, and so if you're single, this is for you. If you're married, um, maybe tune in and listen to this because you can, uh, find encouragement and understanding maybe for a lot of your single friends. But I, you know, as a Christian woman, uh, being now in my fifties, still single, I just want to make it very clear that I didn't grow up or have any desire in any portion of my existence growing up in any age bracket that I was in that I ever thought I would be single. I wasn't raised in a family where singleness was bad. It, it wasn't that, you know, being single was, was, a um, you know, spoken about in a, in a kind of a poor narrative or anything like that. It wasn't anything like that. I think just growing up in a kind of a Christian household, uh, growing up, you know, playing with your Barbies, playing with your, you know, your, your toys uh, and, and m matching your Barbie with your Ken doll or whatever you did as girls, as a kid, I just never, it was just in our household. You grew up, you're going to get married. You had these romantic visions of how it would be that guys kind of held the keys to all of the way that you would find somebody and, They'd swoop in and pick you up and carry you off into the sunset. So um, actually, when I look back on my childhood, um, that's kind of bizarre when you think about it in today's standards. It's not really like that. I know it's not like that. I think maybe for a very small percentage of people, marriage is even like that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very aware how hard marriage is, how the work that you have to come to the table in a marriage and just be ready for, I get all that. I just, I just, in my life, I never, ever thought that I would be in my, um, later fifties single and in this place where everything that I thought that God was going to do, he didn't. And it, it also doesn't limit him. It doesn't say about him that he's not good. It doesn't say about him that he's not an answering God, but there are things in our lives and singleness is one of the biggest issues for me that I have this, um, it's just this vacancy of where the Lord has brought understanding and brought almost a, a, uh, an answer to. And it isn't like, at my age, I walk around with this absolute despair about singleness. And I think this is the reason why, because I have met people 
in their older years that carry the baggage of their singleness. I probably have some baggage in that area of, of my singleness and probably the heartbreak of it maybe, but I try to be super coherent and very responsive to the Lord and very communicative. And, um, I dialogue with the Lord about this a lot. And I have known enough about the presence of the Lord, known enough about the goodness of the Lord, known enough about God's, um, response and his love of me that I don't live in this place of, uh, constantly talking to God about it, having to constantly go over things and then asking why I don't know. I don't know when you stop asking why I think that really depends on your peace that you grab a hold of and the sanctuary of resolve that you get to with the Lord. I've gotten to a lot of beautiful sanctuaries in my life about certain things. Um, forgiveness being one huge hurdle. Obviously I've talked about that and getting to the resolve of forgiveness and being like, yeah, we're done. We've crossed that bridge. Now we know how to do it so that when other stuff comes that feels familiar like that, where you have to forgive people or you have to forgive situations or you have to forgive leaders, you can, you know what that bridge looks like. Singleness is kind of this, it's this kind of perplexing thing because it's connected to desire, the desire of our hearts and God is connected to all the desires of our hearts. And so I am one, and, I'm, and I'll just lay it out there because some people don't have this. I've talked to people that are like, I never had that feeling or I never had that, that call from the Lord. I can tell you that I've always wanted to be married, never wanted to be single. But I can also tell you that I feel very much like the Lord's promised that to me. Now it looks very different at my age than it did when I was feeling those things at 25, 29, 32, you know, in all of these kind of uh, landmarks of your life where, you know, you're watching yourself get older. And as you're getting older, you're dealing with the things in society that say, oh gosh, your age is actually depicting whether or not this will ever happen. Your, your um, age is telling you that this looks totally different now if you were ever to, um, you know, do things like have a baby or, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I used to have folders of cut out wedding dresses and, and flower arrangements. Like I had folders, people. I had like little file folders and I had a certain person that was going to make my wedding dress. I had, you know, I knew the kind of design I wanted. And I don't think I ever actually lit those things on fire. I've lit a lot of things in a canister on fire outside uh, in my backyard on occasion. I don't know that I lit the the bridal file on folder. But I don't, I, I wouldn't even be able to tell you where that is. I'm sure it was thrown out in one of my many moves. And there is a bit of heartbreak when you throw those things away or when you get rid of them or you misplace them and they don't become important. I remember this is actually a tragic story. Um, I can laugh about it now, but I remember ah, I must have been in my 30s, obviously my 30s, where you still kind of feel fresh and alive in your 30s. You know, every time you turn a decade older, it's like people say, you know, um, 40 is the new 30, you know, 30 is the new 20, you know, that kind of thing. We just lie to ourselves constantly. But it's, it's a great saying to have. It makes you feel great in the moment. And, um, and I, I, I was, you know, in a friendship with this really precious pastor. And we were talking about singleness. And she's married, obviously has kids. And she was like, you know what? You should do something as an act of faith. Like do something as an act of faith to like keep the, keep, you know, tell the Lord, like a way to tell the Lord, I'm believing for what you're promising. I mean, there, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if I kind of laugh about it now, it's that I, it, it wasn't that I was kind of naive enough to believe it. I think I was just naive and sweet enough to be like, okay, God, like we'll do this precious little thing. And I do think that God must have looked down on me in that season and been like, man, I love her, but she's so, she's so sweet. But I, she was like, you ought to do something. And I'm like, like what? She said, put a lamp in the window. 
Like put a lamp in the window of your house and keep that bulb always lit as a way to tell the Lord. Nobody else in the neighborhood needs to know about it. Nobody else in your life needs to know about it. But, you know, it's a way to just tell the Lord, hey, that lamp's lit. When that bulb goes out, I'm putting that bulb back in. And I want you to know that lamp is on because I know you've promised me a husband. And um, I'm going to say the lamp was lit for five years. The bulb was changed. That that lamp was lit. And there was one day when I probably was in a sarcastic rut, I'm sure. But there was one day when I felt like that precious <laughs> posture of belief that I had done, which was an act of faith. Like it's an act of faith, peeps. It's an act of faith. There's nothing wrong with declaring. There's nothing wrong with that kind of faith thing. I have talked to people that have more faith in their fingernail of their little pinky than they have, than other people have in their entire body. I have felt like that I'm probably not, um, that if I were given like characteristics, if people were going to be like, oh my gosh, Read his characteristic. I think it's courage or encouragement, obviously, because it's my burn. Faith, I, I don't know that I would ever say, I am just an insane woman of faith. I think I have an insane amount of faith for everybody else. For myself, I think I sometimes feel like I'm on a, and, and some of you can relate with this. I think sometimes I'm on a, like a, like a sarcastic self awareness program where I just, I think I keep enough sarcasm just to keep it real, you know, because I don't want to fall into this blase or this kind of religious mode of, and I think for me, that's the danger. So for other people that, that may be not your danger for me, I think it's my danger where if I get into a routine, if I get into a, like a, a cycle of this is what we do, like this is, you you name this, you claim this. Like I think that just triggers me from my childhood a little bit, and I'm like, okay, we gotta switch it up. We gotta switch it up. Or I just throw a little sarcasm in there just to make sure that I I know that I'm like alive, and and so while I am an absolute firm believer in God's promises over my life, there is this resolve that I've come to where I'm like, but I don't know how I was gonna do it. And what I no longer fight and what I no longer spend a lot of time circling in the pen over is how come he hasn't? How come he hasn't? How come he hasn't? Because there are moments, I have them every year, um, where I'll have a cycle where I'm like, whoa, like I just don't, I, I, like I have to just hold up. Let me sit down for a moment. Let me register this because I don't understand that God. I don't understand you, God, in this position. Like if, if I knew and saw me, was looking at me the way you're looking at me and seeing actually the raw reality of my heart for you and my intention for you and my purity for you and the things that I'm just like, this is yours, man. This is yours. I would never do this to me. Why do you do it to me? And I can tell you right now, just in the saying of that, um, upon you guys hearing it, there are so many people out there who will be like, yeah. Yep, been there, done that. And I think it's why I want to be so like raw and real about it because I don't know. I don't get it. I've said this before on podcasts about certain things like this where we're asking God to do things and we're wanting God to do things and he just does it. God's timing is his own timing. And I don't understand his timing. And that's my humanity for you. That's the flesh's perspective of the timing God is that we just don't get it. And you know what? I'll tell this little story. Um, I think I might've told it on an audible podcast last year before we went to video, but for me, it's such a profound thing. I, I have this crazy friend that I'm going to get on this podcast one day. She's amazing. And she thinks differently. She comes from a different vein and, um, and she was talking to me one day and she challenged me. She's great at challenging me and stuff. And she's a little, you know, different in the way that she processes stuff. But she just said to me, why don't you take God to therapy? And I was like, you mean take God into a therapist's office? And she's like, no, no, no. Let the Holy Spirit be the mediator and just have God, you know, just sit down, ask the Holy Spirit to come and just ask the Lord to come. 
And I'm just crazy enough to do stuff like this. You guys should try it. It's actually amazing. I've trained my ear to hear the voice of the Lord. And um, I get asked a lot, how do you hear the Lord like that? How would you even hear enough to do that? It, it's all in just being willing to sit down with the Lord and and start from just sitting down with a blank piece of paper. I used to do this all the time. Sit down with a blank piece of paper and a pen. And I would just be like, okay, talk to me. And I would just train myself to, to hear things, write down things, just chaos, even the chaos of the buzzing of the TV or something outside or a car passing down the road. Or, and I would just write what I heard. So I would learn to actually tune my ear into what was actually happening in the room. And then I would hear certain things like scriptures. So I would go look up the scriptures and I write them down. So I've, I've trained myself to hear the Lord to where I, I'm, I'm very much one of those kind of people that I'm like, that's the voice of a stranger. I'm not going to follow that. But I do know the voice of the shepherd. So I knew I had enough of that to do this. And I did. I, I sat One day I sat down and I just quieted myself, put some music on. And I was like, Holy Spirit, I, I need to just, I need to talk to Jesus. And I need to bring Jesus into like a therapy session where you mediate for me. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was with me. All of a sudden I closed my eyes and I saw like the Holy Spirit, like a doctor, like a therapist sitting down on this side of the room and, um, Jesus walks in and he sits down on the, on the couch on the other side. And I'm kind of sitting in the middle and Holy Spirit's there and Jesus is there. And, and I'm, I'm in this vision. My eyes are closed and the Holy Spirit looks at me and she says, Rita, this is your session. Like, what do you want to talk to Jesus about? And, and before I even realized that I am having kind of this encounter and that I could pick what I wanted to talk about out of my mouth comes perfect timing. And I'm like, yeah, I want to, I, I want to ask you about perfect timing. And I'm looking at Jesus on this side of the room and I'm like, I would like to ask you about perfect timing. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I think it's one of the most, um, brutal concepts in our spirituality to understand in our humanity. Why is perfect timing so difficult for my, um, my human intellect to understand? And the Holy Spirit in this vision, eyes closed, right? Music playing, looks at the Lord and says, which was so profound in this vision. I'm just, this podcast is about singleness, but this, this whole thing I have with the Lord is pretty profound. You guys should try it. And the Holy Spirit looks at the Lord and says to the Lord, she has a very good question. That's a very good question. Can you please respond to her? And it was almost as if when I saw that, eyes closed, could see this whole picture. When I saw the, and she, the Holy Spirit was a girl in this picture, like a girl therapist. And when, when I heard her say that, I was like, I felt defended in that moment for even asking the question, which a lot of times, you know, the enemy will make us guilt ridden for even asking certain things um, because it feels like we don't have a right to ask those things to the Lord. And I, I felt defended in that moment. But I'll never forget what Jesus said in that moment. And he, he turned to me in this vision. My eyes are closed. I'm having kind of this little encounter, this experiment with the Lord. And he said, actually, it really is a good question. And let me try to relieve some of your um, pressure from this. He said, when my perfect timing in your life is coming into play, it usually is coming into play in a zone for you when you're in a wrestle. And your heart, your spirit, your flesh is usually in a wrestle over something that you're needing a response to based on something that's happening, whether it's trauma, whether it's drama, whether it's conflict, whether it's chaos, there is something going on and my perfect timing is needed in that moment. But it's needed in a moment when you're in a wrestle, Rita. He says, you're in a wrestle with this. And he said, and when you're in a wrestle, your flesh won't be able to see or feel perfect timing because it's going to wrestle and push against the very thing that it doesn't understand. And I, I sat there, eyes closed in this moment, and I thought that makes absolute perfect sense. And I, these situations, you know, singleness being a big one, coming into play, and I'm like, usually 
when I am in a, in a, a sad, brokenhearted state over, let's just say singleness, I am in such a wrestle over it that it isn't just a mind game. It's, it's a, um, it's a spiritual war game. It's like, I don't understand the Lord, which spirals into this and it spirals into that. And then it goes down into your self-worth and then it goes over here to this and it shoots over here to that. It's almost like a, you know, like a, 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 a ping pong, you know, machine that you, you're, 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 um, you're, you're playing where you, you, pull back the thing and you launch that ball and that ball is bouncing all over the place. And it's, it's like all these things are happening. I'm like, yeah, like when I'm in that place where I'm like, I don't understand this. I don't understand this. I'm in a wrestle. And he's like, right. And when you're in that wrestle, you cannot see perfect timing because perfect timing, he says, is laced with peace. And I just was like, I mean, I kind of came out of this thing and I just kind of started weeping. I mean, you could save a lot of money if you just start going, taking God to therapy with the Holy Spirit. But I was so like, I was so uh, um, just blessed in that moment of that revelation that it, it, it helps. And it, it really actually, I think about that a lot now, even when I do think about singleness, because I'm like, oh, I'm asking you again, and I'm in this place. I need to find I need to ask sometimes these questions when I'm at a peace with who God is and what he's doing in my life. And most of the time we're not, we're not, we're not doing that. And so in a big, huge subject, subject like singleness and, or, or maybe for you, it isn't singleness, but you know, I'm speaking to the singles because man, I have never in in my journey, I have met more single women in my life. I don't meet a lot of single guys. I meet so many single women, like amazing, God-filled, spirit-filled, God-loving single women who are really beautiful people who can't seem to find a husband. Now, I'm going to do a podcast. Um, you guys will know about it when I do it with Anna Golden again, and we're going to like do this whole what's up with, with dating guys and dating? What's up with single guys and dating? Because I think it's much needed. Plus it's hilarious. And I think sometimes I just need to get those podcasts out there where it's a lot of fun and laughter. And because sometimes singleness, it's just so broken hearted. It's just like, so, um, there's, and I know it's because there's an aloneness that's funneled into the center of our singleness, right? That's what we feel more than anything else. We feel this absolute sheltered aloneness. In Genesis, please understand this. Scripture has these beautiful, I'm going to reference an, another scripture here um, to just kind of help um, bring some tone to this in the scripture. But, you know, in Genesis, the first emotion that God actually talks about is, is loneliness, like that, that, that thing that, you know, he doesn't talk about, um, you know, uh, affections in a sense, the way he brings in loneliness. Like he talks about loneliness right from the gate. Why? Why does he talk about loneliness straight from the gate? Well, there's a reason for it. There is a lostness in that emotion and that feeling. There is a, um, a segregation all its own in that thing that isolates you, puts you in a corner and actually dismantles and disarms any rights you feel like that you have to a sound mind. Sometimes loneliness is the worst thing that we contend with. And here in scripture, God says to Adam and, and building the counterpart for Adam of Eve, he says, it is not good that man should be alone. He's not saying it's not good for men to be alone. He he's saying mankind, it's not good for mankind to be alone. God gave us himself and in giving us himself, he also gave the counterpart to Adam for Adam to identify and to understand companionship. And so all of that is right there in scripture. So when we're wondering why we were made not to feel alone or why we were made to connect to other people, it's right there in scripture. It's all right there in scripture. So because of that, because of that, that, um, 
that lonely thing that God's like, yeah, this isn't good. I don't want, I want from the gate to put that word in scripture to say it isn't good for man to be alone. Unity, companionship, um, you know, uh, uh, community, all of those things are, are part of what make up the, the beauty of the kingdom of God. And it's why marriage is so profound. It's why this, the, the sacred quality of marriage is so profound. But just having great friendships and having incredible um, connections and relationships, it's why the church is built for us to have great community. Because God understands that when we're in isolation, the enemy breeds hopelessness in our heads. And because we're women and Obviously, there are single men out there too. I'm not just speaking to women. I'm a woman, so I'm probably going to predominantly be, um, uh, you know, encouraging the the female gender in this. But it's the same for guys. If you're, you know, looking for the right wife, and you just you've been dating maybe quite a bit, and you just haven't found the person that you want, but you know God's promised that to you. I think the uh, um, the buzzword. Or the center of this conversation is, if you know that God has promised it to you, there are those of you that are like, I never had a promise from God. I, I talked to uh, um, uh, another gal that um, is in ministry, and you know we we ta- we've talked about it. You know she's still single, and we've talked about singleness. We've had loads of conversations about it, and our last conversation was actually really epic because she was like, "That's the difference between me and you." I can let it go because I was never given a word for it. And I'm like, I was. And so I have loved the idea and begged God for the idea of just being like, let me just lay it down. If you're not going to ever bring it, even though you've promised it, let me just lay it down. Here's the thing about the Lord. If God's promised something to you that you know that you know that you know is from the Lord, to lay it down and walk away from it means that you have laid down your willingness to stay for the timing of the Lord. And so when God does what God is, was always going to do in bringing that, you either miss it or you're going to have to go back and pick up something and unbury something. And that's going to actually create um, an angst in your life or a time zone in your life that you're going to be spending 10 times more energy on something that you didn't need to do if you hadn't laid it down. So if you've gotten a word about something, having a baby, if you are struggling to get pregnant, um, you know, getting healed, even if your word is healing, I understand healing comes in different packages. And I think that's part of a thing from the Lord as well. Those things sometimes look a little bit different, but if you like a a certain job or, you know, um, God's, you know, uh, told you you're going to be reconciled with, with a parent or reconciled with somebody. And, and there's a promise there. Do not leave the valley of where that was promised. Don't bury that because you just, time has gone on and it's just become so, you know, hard for you and heartbreaking for you that you just drop it. Because when God does want to bring it back around and when he does want to accomplish it in his perfect timing, you're going to have to like spend all this time going back, finding out where you, you know, buried it in a ditch, getting a shovel, unburying it, wearing it, putting it back on. And so I've always painfully carried the calling of, of um, the promise of God in, in, in not being single for the rest of my life. Even though at 56, I'm like, meh, it's not that I am like, it doesn't matter anymore. Like, it isn't that. I think for me, the meh part of it is I don't have the file folder anymore. I would never cut out a wedding dress in a magazine anymore. The the girlish, innocent, you know, 20-something-year-old teenager thing in me that was then isn't, isn't in my 50s. It's just not there. I probably would never even buy a wedding dress. Like, like those things are just like, you know, I mean, I don't look at big weddings. I don't think about this. I don't think this. I don't think that. There's just a lot of things that have changed because the scenery has changed in getting older. Now, here is is something I want to speak to because I think it's in all of us and I think it needs to be given a voice, whether it's a small voice. Is that heartbreaking? Can we still feel heartbreak 
in the fact that those things are gone and God didn't do it in the season of those things, when wouldn't it have been beautiful to have planned your wedding from the cutouts in your file folder? Wouldn't it have been beautiful to plan this? Wouldn't it have been beautiful to, to have a child in my thirties, you know, and, um, have been a, a biological mother? Wouldn't it have been? Yeah. And I think it's okay to give those emotions and those feelings in our life, the right to actually be in grief and to have felt the sorrow of those seasons passing. And so I, I want to, I, I want to bring this, um, this chapter in Luke. I just want to read something in Luke because I, I want you to see, um, I just want you to see something kind of beautiful here that actually helped me in my singleness, even though this isn't about singleness, but it is about God doing something in Luke chapter one. We're, um, we're diving into the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth and, it says this um, starting in birth five, because it's the birth of John the Baptist that's being foretold here. And it says, in the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly divi division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Let me read that again. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. I just want to read that. If you've read, if you haven't read Luke chapter one, it's a brilliant, but what's so beautiful about that is that scripture sets us up with who these people are. Here's the lineage of where they come from. They've got credibility and they are righteous people that follow God. Okay. That's who we're dealing with here. That's how the story starts. And then all of a sudden, Zachariah's division is brought up. He goes in with his uh, duty as a priest to bring the prayers of the saints into the altar of incense. And when he's in there, an angel shows up and doesn't come with any bad news. So the shock of an angel being there and the fright of an angel being in there is the one thing. But it isn't about what the angel says that has any bearing or bad news. There's no, there's no burden or no bad news here. It is the angel coming to say, perfect timing. I'm here. You get to have that baby now. But this guy who loves the Lord, who's in a line of descendants, who's a priest, all of a sudden in this place of scripture, his humanity comes to the table and how he really feels pops out of his mouth. And I love that. I love this stuff about scripture because what scripture is allowing Zachariah to have is the humanity of the grief that the long suffering of God's promise does to the soul. What it, it erodes some of our soul. Our, our flesh sometimes isn't, isn't able to withstand the, the burden of the timing of God. And so Zechariah sees this angel. This angel has nothing bad to say, but in what he says, Zechariah is like, whoa, dude, now, like my wife is old. You're kidding me. Like now you think we get to have a baby? Like how is this possible? And then all of a sudden, we all know the story. The, the angel of the Lord, like, mutes him. He can't speak. In fact, he can't speak until the baby's born and somebody, uh, and, and Elizabeth says his name is John. And they say in the house, John, there's nobody in your family named John. And Zachariah writes down a piece of paper. His name is John. Cause that's what the angel said when he met him in that room. And all of a sudden he gets his voice back. Now, now I, I'm bringing this into this context of caring singleness and, um, and, having it be a desire of our heart or really anything be the, the desire of a heart. Um, for me, that would be the biggest subject in my life. Um, but God understands exactly when he'll send what he's going to send. And he also understands the condition of the erosion of my spirit when he brings it. 
and the mercy of God, that here was a man of God and that his disappointment when it comes to the surface isn't going to have him be, be omitting of the promise or not getting to be uh, uh, at the seat of the table of the promise. Now he loses his voice and he loses his voice because what God can't do in the midst of that perfect timing is allow the voice of question to be riding over it. So when you think about how long it takes for a woman to have a baby and the gestation period of, uh, of a, of a embryo to, um, full term, it's about 10 months they say. And so think about if he questioned that angel in that room, think about some of the things that he'd be almost wanting to say in the midst of it. How is your body going to withstand this? What? And I think that, that God was like, no, I want no, I want your voice not to be able to actually hinder the promise of what I'm doing. I don't know why God gives us promises that he doesn't, that he doesn't pan out. Um, in my own life, I think that there was somebody, but I do think that people can make the wrong choices and they can make, um, they can make mistakes along the way. And there are many of us that are bearing and walking in the season of somebody else's bad choice. Um, maybe, maybe some of you don't think that that's the possibility, but I know from the Lord, from my own life, that that's a possibility. I can choose God. You can choose God. You can choose to obey God. I can choose to obey God. But the people that were responsible to be around can be disobedient. And there were moments in my life when the enemy had pathways and roadways for me to become so discouraged in this area that I, if I kept going down that road, I would have totally given in to a completely different idea of what the Lord had for me and a completely different thought process of, yeah, um, I guess maybe he didn't promise that. I guess maybe he didn't promise that. There are, there are strongholds and footholds and, you know, um, attacks and all kinds of things that the enemy throws in our way when our path to the Lord is to remain steadfast in this thing of quite frankly, long suffering. And some of us, you know, have a, a, a longer long suffering than others. You know, I don't, I don't like when I see 20 year olds or 25 year olds and they, they just have gone through date after date, after date, after date, after date, and they can't seem to find the right guy. Ladies, guys, sorry, but I don't know why, but there are, are seem to be a higher number of godly women than there are godly men. I know that for guys, their struggle is different than the struggle that we have sometimes, gals. But I think what we should be doing is just continuing to pray that guys make the right choices. Moms, if you've got sons like I have, you know, I pray that my kid doesn't make wrong choices and that my child as a man doesn't um, create a space in his life where he misses the opportunities God has for him because his flesh gets involved and he makes mistake after mistake after mistake. I, I think that is, is something that God may call us to as women, to pray in like a new generation of men who want to stand and find the godly women that are supposed to be their partners, their life partners. And so I just want to encourage those of you in your singleness. I have never felt I was ever to be single, but at 56 years old, I'm still single. And what is very, very difficult, and I'm going to be super guttural about this and honest, this is what kind of ticks me off in our church a posture, but that I can be a woman who, um, who is fighting for the righteousness of God in my life, living in the purity of God in my life. But because I'm single and at my age, if I walk into a room, what is said about me first is usually not, and this is in general um, above single people, is what is said about us first a lot of times isn't our, our real story, which is she's actually really wanted God to just do what God can do in her life. And usually it's, well, why is she single? 
what's going on. There's something that must have happened. There's something there. And I'm telling you, there's a whole track record of things that, that could have gotten me off of the tracks. But I'm still here, and I'm still serving the Lord, and my life is absolutely 100% the Lord's. And so it is a disservice that we do to those who are in the trenches just believing for the Lord when we think about them things based on what society says should have happened a long time ago that isn't happening or hasn't happened, therefore something must be wrong. And I mean, I don't see that done in the world like I see that done in the church. It just unnerves me that it's like, you know, a lot of times you don't think about that you know, sometimes for a younger guy, but for a woman that's 28, 29, and she's still single, it's like, what's wrong with her? You know, God forbid she be in her 30s, her late 30s, her 40s, her late 40s, and nearing 50, and good grief, what do people think about me? It's like, I can't make God work any faster, but what I want to be responsible to do is to get to the end of the road, no matter what the Lord has done, and say to the Lord, I believed with my whole heart that you were a God of answering. And in faith, I'm going to respond to you and say, I believe that this is what you said, and I'll stand firm on that belief no matter what you choose to do. And I, I, I feel... A, a, a heavenly applaud in that. And, and honestly too, I just don't have it in me. Like, yes, I've done the dating apps and the horror stories of <laughs> the horror stories of just the interaction in pictures or texting, or it's, it's like a, it's like an SNL skit sometimes. And I'm like, I didn't get all the way here. And this is not a superior spirituality, but I didn't get all the way to a place where I, I um, chucked my baggage to actually be saddled with somebody else's. Gals, guys, if you've gotten rid of some baggage in your life, that doesn't mean that that has... Um, created space for you to date somebody so that you could take on their baggage. No, no, there's, there's something, there's a, there's a better way out there. So I just, there's certain things I'm like, yep, I'm, yep, have got no time for that. Nope. Got no time for that. Got no time for that. And it's almost in a sense that God has to actually work in this new season because um, it's, it's not going to be like it was when I was 20. It's not going to be like I was when I was 30. It's not going to be like I was when I was 40. And it's almost like when I adopted Justice, and I remember thinking, has this hindered my singleness? Has this hindered my ability to get married? Because I've done this, and this is valiant, but most guys wouldn't see this as valiant. And so I realized, oh my gosh, adopting Justice probably put me in a narrower uh, capacity for dating and for getting married. And I probably just made it harder for myself. And then I thought to myself, you know what this has made me? This has made me actually have a higher standard for a man because as a mother, that guy would have had to see him, love him, think about him the way I did in order for me to ever make a partnership with him because that kid deserved my all. That kid deserved every piece of me. That kid deserved 100% of all of me. And it deserved 100% of all of somebody else. And why would I think he deserved any less than that? And that's where I've seen that mistake happen over and over and over, where when women lose a guy, they just, and they're married, they just replace it. They replace it. They replace it because they don't know how to live with God's intentions and God's um, God's higher standard. And so I, you know what, you guys, I just want to encourage you if you're single and you're ready to mingle and you still believe God's given you a call to, to be married, man, just stand in it, just stand in it, pray through it. Um, you know, ask God to give you the strength in it. It's hard. Loneliness is hard. It is a, it is a rotting post if you stay there. And I, I, I encourage you 
to just continue believing and pray for whoever God wants to bring you. But also pray yourself out of the season perhaps that you might be in that a guy couldn't find you in. Because you have to understand, you have to take responsibility for the season that you're in that perhaps no one would ever find you in this season if you're not ready to actually discard some of your baggage. So um, I encourage you with that. We'll talk more and more podcasts about singleness. Um, I'm sure that subject will come up again and again and again, which it's great. I love talking about it and encouraging people in it. Um, don't feel, um, don't feel alone in it. I know sometimes it feels alone in it, but singleness does not stop you from living and you can't, you can't look at singleness as just surviving until you get married. You've got to learn how to live. You've got to learn how to live and live abundantly in your singleness. Man, I adopted a baby in my singleness. If that's not, if that's not choosing something else to live, I, I don't back down. I still, I stick with stuff. I keep going. I, 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 I have moments I got to sit down, but, but for the most part, I still take the bull by the horns and I'm like, no, I've got to create, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. So be encouraged today in your singleness. God is for you. He's with you. And don't bury the promises of the Lord. So bless you today. 